and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, Episode 65, Mediterranean Lifeline. As France withdrew from the war, the British found themselves alone in protecting their Mediterranean possessions, their gateway to the Suez that led to India, their greatest overseas possession. And British-controlled India had the resources Britain needed to resist the Axis. Men, a growing industrial capacity, and money. So, exactly how did Gibraltar, Malta, Egypt, Sudan, and Cyprus, that Mediterranean lifeline, come to be a part of the British Empire by 1940? In this episode, we'll examine the recent past of these lands that would soon be used by the British as either unsinkable carriers for their aircraft or bases for their land and naval forces to engage the oncoming Italian and later German forces. Moving from west to east, the first territory to be dealt with is Gibraltar, which is located on the southern end of the Iberian Peninsula. And as it is at the entrance to the Mediterranean Sea from the Atlantic, it would prove invaluable and yet potentially vulnerable for the British. In fact, Britain's hold seemed only to hang on by the whim of Franco of Spain. As for its physical features, the eastern side of the peninsula is dominated by mountains, but its southern landmark, the Rock of Gibraltar, is probably its best known feature. At its foot lays a dense population. The other cities are along the more level western coast. It has an area of 6.8 square kilometers, or 2.6 square miles. And at the outbreak of World War II, its population was just under 30,000. Going back a few hundred years, at the end of the War of the Spanish Succession, in which several European powers sought to prevent the unification of Spain, the weakening but largest European power, with France, an Anglo-Dutch force captured Gibraltar in 1704. The subsequent Treaty of Utrecht in 1713 ceded the Hell territory to Britain, in perpetuity. But in reality, treaties allow the vanquished time to regain strength. And so, the Spanish tried to take back Gibraltar in the siege of 1727 as a part of the Anglo-Spanish War, and then again in the Great Siege of Gibraltar from 1779 to 1783. Both attempts failed. The location of Gibraltar soon proved itself invaluable to the British as a base for the Royal Navy, leading up to the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805, as well as during the Crimean War of 1854-56. to Even more important did holding Gibraltar come in 1869 as the Suez Canal was opened. Now Gibraltar was seen as critical, being halfway between the home island and Egypt and subsequently its fortifications were improved in the late 1800s. But despite these and other improvements, Gibraltar was exposed, much like Guernsey and Jersey, when war was declared. So most of its civilian population was evacuated, either to London, Morocco, Madeira, or Jamaica. And as an extra measure, a fortress was constructed atop the rock of Gibraltar. Given Malta's location in the central Mediterranean, its strategic importance has only grown throughout history. But in the summer of 1940, it became a priceless, unsinkable island fortress for the British. Located 80 kilometers, or 50 miles, south of Sicily, 333 kilometers, or 207 miles north of Libya, 1,755 kilometers, or just over a 1,000 miles east of Gibraltar, and lastly, 1,500 kilometers, or just under a 1,000 miles west of Alexandria, Malta is truly the halfway point between Gibraltar and Alexandria. Control of it would allow its owner to control the central Mediterranean. When looked at closer, Malta is really an archipelago, that covers just over 316 kilometers, or 122 square miles, of land area. Its capital, Valletta, is on the north side of the main island. The word Malta itself 
has the etymology either from the Greek word meli, which means honey, or the Phoenician word meleth, which means haven. Either way, both meanings reflected its significance to Britain. Looking back about 500 years, in 1530, Emperor Charles V gave the islands in perpetual lease to the Knights Hospitaller, led by their Grand Master. But over time, this military religious order fell in popularity, as the ideas of universal freedom and liberty gained momentum, but which shone brightest during their French Revolution. However, their hold on power in Malta ended with the arrival of Napoleon, as he was on his way to Egypt during the French Revolutionary Wars in 1798. Many Maltese had asked Napoleon for help, and he obliged. Sailing just outside the main harbor, Valletta, Napoleon asked for a safe harbor to resupply his ships. But, once inside the harbor, he trained his guns on the military forces there. Grandmaster Hompesh had no choice but to surrender. Then, with his usual speed and efficiency, Napoleon, in only six days, created a government commission, which was to have twelve municipalities. He organized a public finance administration, abolished all feudal rights and slavery, and gave freedom to all Turkish slaves. This new rule of law would be administered by a judiciary branch of twelve judges. Lastly, he established the foundation for a primary and secondary education. He then set sail for Egypt, leaving behind, of course, a garrison in Malta. But it was not to last. The French forces on the island quickly became unpopular, what with their antipathy towards Catholicism, not to mention the pillaging of churches to fund Napoleon's wars. The people eventually rebelled, which forced Napoleon's troops to withdraw. Besides, they were soon needed elsewhere. But to make sure the French did not come back, Great Britain, the Kingdom of Naples, and the Kingdom of Sicily sent military assistance to the Maltese. Of course, the British sent naval forces to the islands. Once the French forces either surrendered or evacuated, the Maltese people asked Admiral Alexander Ball to allow Malta to become a British dominion. The British government agreed, and Ball became the first British governor of Malta. And in 1814, as a part of the Treaty of Paris, Malta officially became a part of the British Empire. Egypt, which had been under the control of the Ottoman Empire for hundreds of years, finally broke away in 1805. Afterward, it paid homage to the Ottoman Empire, but was independent in all but name. Then, internal strife came as a question of succession arose between Egyptian national forces and a local leader, backed by Europe's greatest powers. However, all these questions were settled as Egypt was occupied by Britain in 1882. By then, Britain had taken over Egypt's part of the ownership of the Suez, and in reaction, a nationalist movement was started. Britain feared losing its influence in the country, and so invaded in 1882. And even though the real power in Egypt was with the British High Commissioner, a puppet government was established. In 1914, Egypt's status changed to that of a British protectorate. This transpired because leader Abbas II, the figurehead, sided with the Ottoman Empire and the Central Powers in the First World War, so was promptly disposed by the British in favor of his uncle, Hussein Kamel. Ottoman sovereignty over Egypt, which had been hardly more than a legal fiction since 1805, was now officially terminated. Hussein Kamel was declared Sultan of Egypt. At the end of World War I, a group known as the Waft, meaning delegation, attended the Paris Peace Conference in 1919 to demand Egypt's independence. Included in the group was a political leader, Zahad Zaglou, who would later become Prime Minister. But all this was happening too fast for the British, so the Egyptian delegation was arrested and deported to the island of Malta by the British. Unsurprisingly, a huge uprising started in Egypt. 
During March and April of 1919, there were mass demonstrations that turned violent. This is known in Egypt as the First Revolution. Britain, again reacting to events, strongly repressed the anti-occupation riots. Some 800 Egyptian people died. Still, trying to get a handle on things, in November of 1919, the Milner Commission was sent to Egypt by the British to attempt to resolve the situation. In 1920, Lord Milner submitted his report to Lord Curzon, the British Foreign Secretary, recommending that the protectorate status should be replaced by a treaty of alliance. As a result, Curzon agreed to receive an Egyptian mission headed by Zaglou and others to discuss the proposals. The mission arrived in London in June 1920, and the agreement was concluded by August. In February 1921, the British Parliament approved the agreement, and Egypt was asked to send another mission to London, with full powers to conclude a definitive treaty. Another political leader, Adli Pasha, led this mission, which arrived in June 1921. However, the Dominion delegates at the 1921 Imperial Conference had stressed the necessity that Egypt maintain control over the Suez Canal Zone. Curzon took this and other Egyptian requirements to his cabinet, but was unable to push through a majority vote. The mission returned to Egypt empty-handed. In December of 1921, the British authorities in Cairo imposed martial law and once again deported Zaglou. Demonstrations again led to violence. Then, a direct, if rather undemocratic, solution was instituted. In deference to the growing nationalism, and at the suggestion of the High Commissioner, Lord Allenby, the UK recognized Egyptian independence in 1922, abolishing the protectorate and converting the Sultanate of Egypt into the Kingdom of Egypt. Sarwat Pasha became Prime Minister. But there was no way Britain would relinquish the Suez or its position in the country so quickly. And so, British influence continued to dominate Egypt's political life. But it must be said that they continued to foster fiscal, administrative, and governmental reforms. Britain retained control of the Canal Zone, Sudan, and Egypt's external protection. So, representing the Wad Party, Zaglou, released from his second exile, was elected Prime Minister in 1924. He demanded that Britain recognize the Egyptian sovereignty over Sudan, but this was further than Britain was willing to go. On November 19, 1924, the British Governor General of Sudan, Sir Lee Stack, was assassinated in Cairo, and pro-Egyptian riots broke out in Sudan. The British demanded that Egypt pay an apology fee and withdraw troops from Sudan. Zaglul agreed to the first, but not the second and then resigned. The tension between Britain and Egypt over Sudan remained. Later, King Fuad, King Kamel's successor, died in 1936, and during his reign, he and the British had a new series of problems to deal with. The Wad Party, a broad-based nationalist political organization, resisted British domination and their control over the Suez Canal. But their problems only grew as a communist party came into being in 1925, as well as the Muslim Brotherhood in 1928. King Fuad was succeeded by his son, Farouk, who was only 16 at the time. The young king's ministers poured into his ears their fear of Mussolini's recent actions in North Africa. So, Egypt signed an Anglo-Egyptian treaty, which stipulated that Britain would withdraw all forces except those needed to protect the Suez Canal. The number of troops was limited to 10,000, along with their support staff. However, the times being what they were, the treaty also called on Britain to train the Egyptian army and help defend the country in case of war. The British would use this clause to keep more than the 10,000 limit within the country. I love that sound. The sound of another sale on Shopify, the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. What are you waiting for? Shopify gives entrepreneurs the resources once reserved for big business. 
So upstarts, startups, and established businesses alike can sell everywhere, synchronize online and in-person sales, and effortlessly stay informed. I love how Shopify has the tools and resources to make it easy for any business to succeed from down the street to around the globe. Shopify powers millions of businesses from first sale to full scale, reach customers online and across social networks with an ever-growing suite of channel integrations and apps, including Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and more. Gain insights as you grow with detailed reporting of conversion rates, profit margins, and beyond. More than a store, Shopify grows with you. This is Possibility, powered by Shopify. Go to shopify.com slash worldwar2, all lowercase, for a free 14-day trial and get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. Grow your business with Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash world war two right now. Shopify.com slash world war two. Lastly, we'll look at Cyprus. This island is at the far eastern edge of the Mediterranean and is 240 kilometers or 149 miles wide with a length north to south of 100 kilometers or 62 miles. Turkey is 47 miles to the north. Syria and Lebanon are 105 kilometers or 65 miles to the east, and Egypt is about 380 kilometers or 236 miles south, and Greece is 280 kilometers or 174 miles to the northwest. Like many other territories nearby, Cyprus was conquered by the Ottoman Empire in 1751. Yes, someone needs to do a podcast about the Ottoman Empire. Anyway, The island remained under their control, but that changed with the Russo-Turkish War of 1877-78 to and the Congress of Berlin, where Cyprus was leased to Britain in 1878. The question, of course, is, why would the Ottoman Empire do this? In exchange for Cyprus, Britain promised to help protect the Ottoman Empire from Russia in the future. And like Egypt, Cyprus continued to pay homage to the Ottomans old habits do die hard. But, just like Egypt and Sudan, when the Ottoman Empire went with the Central Powers in World War I in 1914, Britain formally annexed Cyprus on November 5th. In 1915, Britain offered Cyprus to Constantine I of Greece, on condition that Greece join the war on the side of the British. But Constantine declined the offer. So World War I ends, and in 1923, the nascent Turkish Republic relinquished any claim to Cyprus. Two years later, the island was declared a British crown colony. But after becoming a crown colony, tension increased between the Britons and the locals on the island. They were determined to have independence or join with Greece. And by 1931, this tension led to open revolt. Riots broke out, which caused the death of civilians and destruction of property. And in one event, the British government house in Nicosia was burnt down. The riots continued, and Britain reacted harshly with restrictions. Soon, political parties were banned, and all government positions were appointed by the British government. Municipal elections would not come again until 1943. But of course, when Italy invaded Greece in October of 1940... These differences were put aside to face a common foe. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. Um, As you can hear in my voice, I'm not at my best right now, but hopefully um, you were still able to understand everything I said in this episode. Um, I've been getting a lot of emails from people um, very nice emails relating their um, relatives' experiences during World War II, either as a combatant or as, uh, or as a civilian trying to survive. And I was thinking, um, I know it's 2012, but if any of you wanted to sit down with someone and maybe record a conversation with an experience that someone had, whether they were a soldier or just someone trying to survive or, or anything like that, that would be really great. I could put a couple together and make a show out of it because I've really gotten a lot of um, good emails, but I, I don't feel that I have the right to 
to share that with everybody. But if you either wanted to um, interview someone and send it to me in an MP3 form, format, or if you remember a specific story that someone told you, maybe they're no longer with you anymore, but if you wanted to just um, um, relay that story to me uh, and send it to me in MP3 format, I could put that together and make a show out of it because I've been get, getting a lot of good stuff. Um, and I think, just think it would be neat for everybody else to hear. I just don't feel that I have the right to, to put that out there without asking. So please send me any of that anytime that you would like. Just put it in an MP3 format, email it to me, and I can put them all together. And I hope you enjoyed um, – the episode with Professor Andrew Lambert. I'm sorry about the quality on his end. I don't know what was going on. I was at my local library. I thought everything would be fine. But I still think that his uh, his words came through, even if they weren't perfect. And uh, it was a, a sheer delight to talk to him. He's a very knowledgeable, very charming man. Um, he's going to be back with us uh, early next year once we get to the war in the Atlantic. Um, and as I got two or three dozen emails from you um, expressing your extreme disappointment that none of his books were on uh, Audible, I was disappointed as well. Um, so I, I wish they were. I'm terribly sorry. I did send an email to my Audible rep um, asking her to please um, do whatever it is they do to get the process started. Uh, and I think there is a place on Audible on their website where anybody can make a recommendation. So if you wanted to do that and say, please get this, these brilliant books on Audible, that would be great. Um, and that's just really the only way I can think to thank Professor Lambert for uh, spending his time with us. So as many of you probably figured out by now, the World War II tour did not happen this year. Uh, there was a lot of interest. A lot of people email me and say, hey, let me know when you're in. I'll come by and I'll buy you a pint, which means I would have been drunk the entire tour because I got a lot of emails. Um, but basically, people at the end of the day didn't sign up. Um, so here's what I'm thinking. I would like to give it another go for next year. So here's the plan. If you are interested in coming on the tour next year, say the second or third week of October, and what I'm thinking is maybe cutting it back a little bit uh, to reduce the cost, I'm thinking London, Portsmouth, uh, Normandy, and Dunkirk. Maybe just cut it in half right there. If you are interested in coming in next year, if you can send me an email um, say between now and the end of January next year, I'll gather up those emails, send them over to my rep at the tour company, and then we can see if we can put something together. So um, that should give you a little over a month to do that. So please send me an email only if you're uh, keenly interested. I, I still want to make it happen. I just need to visit these places that I've been reading about and talking about for years now. And I will do this uh, sometime in my lifetime, but I would like to do it on a tour and uh, meet a lot of you. So if you're interested, send me an email by late January, and I'll send them, send them on, and we'll see what we can put together. And I know I didn't give you an official Audible recommendation this time. I have been listening to uh, this one particular book, Alastair Cook, The Essential Letters from America, the 1940s and 50s. I found this really interesting, even though it's a bit outside of, of where we're at right now. But basically, it's a selection of his finest letters from America. They're obviously in chronological order. And he covers everything like the threat to the United States during World War II, the funeral of Franklin D. Roosevelt. And one particular letter I found interesting was um, when a bomber hit the Empire State Building. And, of course, he covers the presidential election of 1948. So if you wanted a recommendation, I would go with that. You can find that on Audible. Um, but I'll have something for you next time. And last but certainly not least, I would like to thank the uh, contributors who, again, I've ordered a lot of books over the last couple of weeks uh, besides Professor Lambert. So I wanted to thank Justin C. from Costa Mesa, California. Then I got a donation and a really interesting email from Martin Winston G., in the net from the Netherlands. Uh, it turns out that he was born on the day that Churchill died. All his brothers and sisters that had come before him had um, saints, uh, names of saints used as their middle name. And his father had just heard about Winston passing and he was, he had to go down to whatever the local government house and register him. And at the last moment he changed his middle name to Winston. So I thought that was really neat and really touching. So I was born on the day that Paul Renault died, and Martin was born on the day that Winston Churchill died. Yeah, I just thought that was neat. Um, Chris B. from Essex, UK, ordered a CD for a Christmas gift for someone. Thank you, Chris. Benjamin G. from Australia sent a donation. Thank you, Benjamin. Uh, Garrett F. from Killarney, 
Ireland. I probably said that wrong. I'm sorry. Thank you. Tracy D. from Allen, Texas. Um, donated. Thank you. Joseph S. from Victoria, Australia. Thank you. Um, Paul J. from Bristol, UK. Robert P., my good friend who's quickly becoming my best friend from Torrance, California, donated. Uh, Russell R. from Buckinghamshire in the UK. And then John L. ordered um, some CDs for friends, and he's in um, Hampton, Victoria, Australia. Thank you, John. And then Garth T. from New South Wales, Australia. So again, thank you guys and gals very much. I really do appreciate it. A lot of new books are coming my way, and I couldn't do it without you. And again, I just want to really apologize for the sound of my voice in your ear right now. Uh, I was going to wait a couple days, but Laszlo Montgomery of the China History Podcast kept pushing me. He's always doing that. So I thought I'd sit down and give it a try. So um, I've got a lot of good books coming in on the Toronto attack that uh, Professor Lambert talked about, but I wanted to give you as much detail as possible. As soon as those books come in, I'll put out the next episode. I might do a short bio on on Admiral Cunningham. We'll see. But I also want to do a a short episode on my experience at the D-Day Memorial, and it will have pictures on it as well. It will be an MP4 format as soon as I figure out all the details. So a lot of um, exciting things coming soon. Please let me know if you're interested in the tour next year. Please, I would love to hear your stories about your relatives during World War II. Um, Just nothing fancy. You don't need a $100 microphone. Just record it with a computer. As long as we can hear you, that's fine. Uh, Just send it to me in MP3, and I would love to hear that and put it together and make a show. So um, I hope you all have happy holidays in case I don't get my voice back for the rest of December. And as always, take care, everyone.